Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, folks, I guess you've been hearing about it. We're, we're in an election period at this point in time, and it's really getting to the point that we've got to pay attention. But the first thing I'm going to tell you right up front, start getting ready to, to vote. You know, if, if you haven't registered to vote, get out there and register to vote. In all due respect, you can't say anything if it's after the fact and, because it's over, okay? So it's very, very important you understand what the issues are about and you understand the candidates. And that's exactly what I'm going to be doing uh, this particular hour. I've got some, I've got some very talented folks, and they're, they're individuals, but we're talking about uh, what, they're, what they're going to be, what they're representing. Let's put it that way, okay? And that's why I always start off by saying, as you know, I've been wearing my hat right off the bat, Vietnam. You know, I like to tell all those vets, thanks for serving. And uh, the fact of the matter is, get out, and uh, if your family's of a vet, and if they haven't gone to the VA to get his card so they can get those services, make sure you get you, you can get, the, get to them right up front. It's very, very important. Okay, what we're going to do today is that uh, we're going to give you sort of an update version of the, 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 uh, the election process as it's, as it's being laid out through the various media and, and the like. Uh, but um, we're going to talk about it from the national perspective, the presidential race. We're going to use that as a kind of a way because that's, been, that's basically what everybody is hearing about. We can't go from state to state. And then we're going to bring it back to Oregon. We're going to bring it back to Oregon, and we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening around the state. And uh, then from that particular point, we're going to bring it here in the Portland metropolitan area. It's the largest area, if you will, the largest district in the state. And so we're going to try to focus on some of those issues. And I would, I would respectfully say for those who are outside of the Multnomah Portland area that you sit around and have discussions uh, with, with uh, other politios, people who are running for office and the like. And then uh, after we've done that, uh, we're going to talk about solutions. That's very important. It's, it's one thing to talk about issues, but the thing is that we're interested in is solutions. So it's going to be, this is sort of Oregon show, and I want you to understand that, but we're going to be focusing on the, um, uh, the, uh, the largest district in the state of Oregon is very important. So doing this with me, uh, to, my, to my right, but to your left on the screen, I've, I've got James Bugle. He's, uh, he's an attorney, and he's also the new chair of Multnomah County Republican Party. And I might add also, too, um, I'll be giving a cry out to the Democrats as time goes along. It's been a little tough getting them on the show, but, but we'll get them on there. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe get them on with, with, with James, if you will. If it does, uh, he wouldn't mind. He had no problem with that. But anyway, i got James Bugle. He's an attorney. He's a local attorney, very outstanding attorney here locally in, in, uh, in southeast Portland. Uh, but he is now the present new chair of Multnomah County Republican Party. And they are reaching out, and I know they are because I happen to be a part of that process. <laughs> and then uh, to his immediate uh, right, but to your left, again on the, on the, on the screen, is Scott Jurgensen. He's, he's an author, and he's also chief of staff for one of the major senior senators uh, in, the, at the, in the state legislature, and that is uh, Senator Doug Whitsitt, right? Yes. Doug Whitsitt. And he's, got, he's going to be with us here. And then we've got uh, Richard Patrick Burke. You might have seen Richard on, the, uh, on last week's show. And he was, he's the executive director of, of uh, Western Liberty Network. You heard him talk. We talked about his program and whatever. And we've sort of carried him on as a solution. And that's why we, we want to talk about that piece, too. Okay. So, folks, what we're going to do, the first 30 minutes, we're going to talk about um, issues. We're just going to talk about issues across the board, so to speak. And then after that, uh, we're going to be talking about solutions. And these individuals have some very specific things to talk about in regards to how we're going to, how we're going to address those issues. Okay? All right. So, so let's start off by, uh, why don't we just go around the table and introduce ourselves? Let's start off with you, James. Well, kind of already did. Yes. I'm the new chair of the Multnomah County Republican Party. Our mission is to try and spread Republican principles, principally the idea that we should not be all locked on some plane that is crashing into an Armageddon of endless debt and endless wars and totalitarian government picking up every dime we've got trying to mm -hmm. keep this thing running. Mm -hmm. Okay. Scott? I'm Scott Jorgensen, Chief of Staff for Oregon State Senator Doug Woodsett. I'm also the author of three books, Transition, uh, Conversations with Atia, and On the Cusp of Chaos. Okay, fine. Bridget? 
Hi, I'm Richard Burke. I'm the Executive Director of the Western Liberty Network. Western Liberty Network is a 501c3 educational foundation, and what we do is we train grassroots political activists how to take responsibility for their own self-governance, particularly in their communities, how to run for local office, how to govern once there, how to manage campaigns, how to be good campaign volunteers, and just pick up particular skills that people need to be effective in civic life. Okay, now you've got them, folks. So let's get right down to the business aspect of it. Okay, gentlemen, I guess the, the thing that's most talked about now, and we just have to sort of pull it, that's what we're going to try to do, sort of pull it in, so to speak, for, for a lot of the folks, that, the lay folks, that, the, viewer, the viewers here, and that is the presidential race. We got two sides there. We got the, the major aspect of it, and actually we hear about the Democratic side, and we hear about the Republican side. I mean, there are, there are other fashions, but those are the ones that are out there, if you will, uh, with uh, uh, with the powers to be, right? With the press, with the media, all that other mm -hmm. good stuff. And let's talk about the Trump piece of it. And let's talk about the Republican Party and Trump. I mean, I, I'm throwing it out there and saying, Trump, I don't know the rest of the fellas. Let's talk about it. Who wants to get right up in there, right up front? Yeah, I, I will. One of the things about Donald Trump, and you see his polling numbers, it's all about name recognition. And there has to be an acknowledgement on some level that Donald Trump has been world famous pretty well my whole life. He's been a household name. I'm 35. So even growing up in the 80s, you knew who Donald Trump was. And the fact of the matter is, at this point in time, this is a reality TV world. And Donald Trump is a reality TV star and one of the biggest reality TV stars. So he has that built in advantage over any would be candidate. Although I, I think there are a lot of rank and file Republicans who are kind of terrified of the prospect of him getting the nomination because they think that it would essentially sabotage the party's chances in the general election. Look, I think he'd be better than any of the Democrats. I'm not worried about that. I mean, I think I think he's tapping into some real concerns. You know, the, the bottom line is that the top of both parties has lost contact with the middle class and the common man, and they're off pursuing these missions that are hostile to a middle class and to a common man. And Trump is uh, calling them out quite clearly on that. And and perhaps, of course, the number one is immigration. You know, mm -hmm. the, the citizens of the uh, citizens, people living around the world do not have a civil right to come to America. You know, we as a nation have the right to control who comes in and who doesn't come in. And at many times in our history, we've said, whoa, you know, we, we've got enough now. You know, mm -hmm. let's take a pause. And instead, we have um, the two heads of the parties, the de Democrats promoting this notion that, you know, there are no borders and everyone has a right to come here and everyone has a right to live off public assistance and let's not think about how we're going to pay for that. And, and then we've got the top of the Republican Party, which is, you know, we've got a bunch of rich corporations giving us money and let's make more profit for them by bringing in more workers so we can drive the wages down. And Trump sees that and Trump is calling it out and people are responding favorably to a truth that is there. And the truth mm -hmm. is that we've had too much immigration for a while, more than the country could absorb in a way that maintains its, its integrity and its, its institutions and, and, and even basic things like functioning health care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. James, I want to bring you on. The point I want to bring up is that you know, that's how he basically got to the table to start was the immigration aspect of it. But in all due respect, that same entity in Congress, if you will, were the ones that established the guidelines for citizenship. And they, they had the guidelines, the law, if you will. You know, illegal is illegal, right? I'm throwing that out to you. But at well, the same time, you had employers. Someone had to hire these folks. I want, how, do you, how do you talk to that, well, those two issues? I think getting on those two issues, I think, is to miss the forest for the trees. Talk to me. Okay. Um, James is, is right. John, Donald Trump is not a conservative. He's, if anything, he's populist. He doesn't really adhere to any clear ideology. But for years, Americans, middle class Americans, working class Americans, have felt like that they've been sold a bill of goods, the lesser of two evils. They've been managed. They've been hemmed in. They've been slowly restricted. And Many un unemployed. Many and unemployed. Now. Unemployed. They, economically and and civically, they've been sort of hemmed in, and the world is kind of closing in around them as they lose freedom, as they lose prosperity. And there is this giant thing called government, which is something they feel disconnected with, they don't feel is necessarily working in their best interest, and there is an unarticulated anger, frustration, and fear. And Donald Trump speaks very eloquently to that. And that's why he's able to get away with getting facts wrong. That's why he's able to be immune from attacks, is because folks are saying, well, that may all be true, but there is a truthiness 
you know, to quote Stephen Colbert, there is a truthiness to the core of his message. People are responding to that. Now, talking to the reality TV show that Scott Jorgensen mentioned, I studied the uh, gubernatorial election of Minnesota when Jesse Ventura was elected. Mm -hmm. And he trailed almost every poll right up to election day. He was coming in third in most of the polls. And then to everyone's astonishment, he won. And what they found out was that he won because the polls only looked for likely voters. They didn't capture people who had never voted in their life, but they voted for Jesse Ventura because they were a wrestling fan. It, males 18 to 35 came out in huge numbers, checked his name off, didn't vote for anybody else, and that put him over the top. What you're going to see is Donald Trump, you know, unless he completely self-destructs, he's going to bring in millions of people who have never voted before, who don't care about politics, who saw him on TV. Well, that's what James was saying. Yeah. That's what James was saying, but, then, but, then, but at the same time... And that's why he would beat Hillary. I believe if he went against Hillary, I think that's why he would beat Hillary. But why is that? The, the reason why he's at the table, again, I'm throwing this back out to the table, if mm -hmm. many of those middle-class folks, some of those middle-class folks that weren't working, if they were working, I don't think we'd be, we'd be sitting there talking about the Trump. Either. Well, it, you brought up the issue of immigration, oh. and that's one of the things that Terrence has been talking about. And I don't think it's a good issue to run on, and I'll explain why. Okay. We tried that back in 2006. The Republicans were kind of on the defensive at that point about the war on terror and a lot of the policies that the Bush administration was implementing. And they tried to go that direction in the 2006 election, screaming about immigration, and still mm -hmm. lost nationally big time. Here's the thing. At the end of the day, the fastest growing demographic in the United States is the Hispanic population. And I'm half Hispanic myself, actually. My mother is a Mexican. Um, my grandmother was Catholic. The vast majority of people that I'm related to are Mexicans. So I'm sensitive to that issue. Okay. And a lot of them are Catholic. They have very conservative values. They believe in the American dream. They believe in capitalism and would be right in lockstep with Republicans on a lot of issues. But all they hear out of a lot of Republicans is that we want to send them back to Mexico. Now, there does need to be a process by which people can immigrate legally and not take years and years and years to mm. do it. But there's other issues involved, too. One is the fact that immigration from Mexico actually has gone down over the last few years, due largely, in fact, to the fact that our economy is not doing great. Mm -hmm. our, the, that's the solution, it turns out, to immigration, is to have the U.S. economy stay so bad for so long that they just go home. Self-deport. My mom lives down in Lancaster, and she says that she's been watching it for years, that a lot of the Mexicans are going back to Mexico. And it, at the end of the day, well, we, we had this thing, you know, the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, that passed during the uh, Clinton administration. And it, if if the economy in Mexico still isn't doing great for the average person there, right. if the economy in the U.S. still isn't doing great for the average person here, and if NAFTA was a cause of that, then perhaps it should be revisited. Maybe it's working for the Canadians. I don't know. I haven't heard them complain about it. Right? But I think that would have to be part of the solution. Something that I always think about when I hear about Mexican immigration is I look at this country of Mexico, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it has no excuse to be poor. They've got access to both oceans. They're next to the United States. They've got rare minerals. They've got oil. They've got agriculture. They've got tourism. They've got shipping. This country has everything it needs to be one of the richest countries in the world, and it's not because it has been systemically corrupt. The United States has been something of a safety valve of people that have no place to go. And I think we've been an enabler to the government of Mexico, much like an enabler is an enabler to an alcoholic or a drug user. I think that it would be good for the United States, it would be good for Mexico and world prosperity for our nation to put more pressure on the Mexican government to reform itself to be a better place for its people to live, not because we don't want Mexicans to come to the United States, but they, there's no reason a nation as wealthy as Mexico should have so many economic refugees. Okay, James, I'm going to bring you on this piece. Come on. Well, I, want to, I want to disagree with Scott in the following sense. He says it's not good to run on the immigration issue, and, and I think that's an oversimplification. I think it's not true that, that the issue is a third rail of politics. I think you have to break the issue into pieces. In other words, why is it that if somebody goes and commits five or six crimes, they're automatically released over and over again, and, you know, does anybody really object to deporting this person? No. You know, there's polls among immigrants, and the immigrants think that it's too hard to, to, to get rid of people like that. You know? Does anybody really think 
that the border needs to essentially be completely uncontrolled with all of these bizarre schemes like designating part of it as an endangered species area so the border patrol can't go there and the coyotes can. I mean, we have a total systematic corruption and breakdown of security at the border, which is now producing, you know, not Mexican immigration, but Syrian immigration, Iraqi immigration, Afghanistan immigration. And border control Af is a national security issue. Right. And, and, yeah. and there's yeah. nothing wrong with running on that. There's nothing. Th there are other components of immigration policy that are things that are just made up, like the business that if you happen to have your child here, they're automatically an American citizen. No other country in the world does that. Yeah. You know, most people, if you ask them about it in the, in the abstract, it's like, no, that doesn't make any sense. You know, I think and so we have policy after policy yeah. that is hostile to middle class interests. It makes no sense at all. And we have to be able to distinguish between good immigration and bad immigration. Mm -hmm. Just instead of just saying, oh, well, you know, we can't touch the immigration thing at yeah. all because then people call us nasty racists. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry. We got to get past that. One mm -hmm. legitimate beef is that the immigration process is inordinately slow and expensive. My, my wife, who's a Russian national, came in through the K-9 visa program. It, it took, you know, like a year and a half and probably about $20,000 to bring her in. And I know that in the case of Mexico, the immigrants, they're talking about years on the waiting list and lots of expense. I think that Republican candidates could make more hay out of the immigration issue if they would talk about expanding the staffing and streamlining the process mm -hmm. so that legitimate immigration is, you know, faster, more, affordo more affordable. And so people, you know, it's, it's, I can see how someone who's here illegally might say, you know, I came up here with my grandmother. If I have to go through the process, she'll be dead. You know, so I yeah. did what's it's, expedient. It's totally broken. It's mm -hmm. totally it's broken. broken. It, if I think, I think. How that did we get there? I mean, I'm a libertarian. We, we talking, I want to be. I, know, I want to be clear. How but, did we get there? I, know, I realize you got it. You got a couple. Of, but how did we get there? Now I think it was doing the right. By not enforcing our own laws is a right. big part of it. And I'm going to piggyback on what something he said. What about the three million? Let's talk about. Wait, let me get this part of it. Let's talk about. Let's talk about how we got there. I mean, initially it was the three million, right? Remember the three million. The three million that we basically gave citizenship to. I was nine years old when Ronald nope. Reagan left office. But my point is that, but my point is that <laughs> we, that's how we started. And right up front with you, it's a neighboring state. I mean, na neighboring country aspect of it. And you know what? The folks that are coming over here, all of a sudden, they just basically said, "Okay, fine." But then the administration said that was it. We weren't going to do this anymore, right? Remember that? But then all of a sudden, <laughs> they just started keep coming in, and nobody said anything. Got political. Nobody mm -hmm. said anything. Looked the other way around. Middle class were working at that point in time, so it was not an issue. It was affecting the poor, but it wasn't affecting, if you will, the middle class, okay? Then all of a sudden, we got 10 million people sitting here, and somebody trying to figure out, what do we do? And when, in all due respect, a lot of these folks know people here. Mm -hmm. they, they, you know, like you said, they're Catholics. I'm a Catholic, too, but my point is, they knew folks. So the bottom line is that you got 10 million folks here, aspect of it. No one wanted to touch it. And all of a sudden, Trump comes up and says, hey, wait a minute. Let's talk about what, what happened to the laws and this, that, and the other. How did we get here? We got to do something. We got these poor folks, and all due respect, that ought to work. Well, yeah, and I wanted to make a few points. Talk here. to me. The first is that I'm a third generation American on my dad's side okay. of the family, okay. on the white side of my family, the Jorgensen side of my family, right? My grandfather, my paternal grandfather was the first Jorgensen male born in this country. My mom's side of the family has been here way longer. Mm -hmm. And that's just the bottom line. And that's how that community thinks of it. The other thing I wanted to touch upon is that, you know, James mentioned about wages. And it's true because you have this big push nationally and especially in Oregon right now for a higher minimum wage. So at the same time that you have that pressure where people wanting more wages, you've got all of this aspect pulling down wages on this end, oh, yeah, and, and these things are just about mutually exclusive. Well, They're working at cross government. purposes. That's, that's classic it. government. Yep, yep, Create yep. a problem, and then we need more government that's to right. solve that's it. Right. And the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, he'd said in passing about you know, not making it a third rail, and that's true. If you look at the 2014 election in Oregon, the biggest outlier of that was Measure 88. And we had done focus groups all over the state prior to that, and that was the bill. The legislator, legislature had passed a law that would have enabled... Uh, undocumented people to have driver's cards, okay. right? And so we we did focus groups of voters, likely voters of all demographics, of all across the political spectrum. And even the most liberal of liberals in those focus groups got violently angry 
when, when we told them and what this supported. ballot measure yeah, did. Supported. And mm -hmm. if you look at the numbers, I mean, that ballot measure went down in flames. Well, uh, if it had been a candidate, it would have won every county can, except Mount Candidates Monodia. that supported okay. measure. Well, 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 better yet, better yet, uh, when it first came out, uh, it was it came out right actually from the conservatives, mm -hmm. the Republican Party, and they called called the person who was basically the chairperson of that, that group, they called him a racist. Mm -hmm. yeah. And well, in and fact, I even, uh, so all of a sudden he yeah. got someone else to support him. In fact, they were on the show. <laughs> and we educated more folks. And as you say, and after, after folks understood what was going on. And so my point is that we're going right back to the Trump situation. He brought it out to the table. Well, and one of the key drivers of Measure 88 was Representative Sal Esquivel from Medford. Yeah. And he is the son of an immigrant. And if I remember right, his father had come over to the United States as part of one of so those So he was part, of, part of the process? So he gets it. And that's the folks who had to go through the process, who did, who immigrated properly... Feel, like everybody else feel quite differently about this issue because well, they, and should, they should shouldn't they, they should, should shouldn't they? yes yeah, it's okay. almost insulting okay. to them when you say you had to jump through all these hoops and pay all this money and, and spend all this time and yet we're going to give the same rights to somebody who did none of those things okay okay it is one other thing here, we got okay we got about another 10 minutes before we're going to be jumping onto another subject area let's get another hot issue that's running around it's called the muslim issue Okay, ISIS, we know that, pay. but it's Muslim. It brought it down to the table here aspect yeah. of it. Okay, now, now when they started talking about the Muslims, all of a sudden, uh, you know, now what do we do about that piece? I guess I don't know how many millions of people we've got here that are that are actually American citizens aspect of it. Right. But we got a thing called mosque, if you will. You got me. And in all due respect, and I'll just throw it right on out. When when I think they initially when folks looked at the Muslim thing, they related it to the blacks. Muslim initially are blacks, but in all due respect, majority wise, they're not black. But oh. the fact of the matter is, we've got this such we got such a divide here in our country. We're we're dealing with it from a from a from a i.e. in all due respect, a race issue, so to speak. So we get blogged up in that piece aspect of it. So how do we get out of that deal? Well, the thing and is, he is brought it up. He just basically said, "Hey, here it is on the table." We got these folks that are coming out here. We got all these Trump. blacks coming over here from the border, yeah. and it really you excited mean Trump folks. It up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he didn't say I say black. I'm just saying he just said Muslims. But guess what? That that group that we brought back the Civil War again. All of a sudden, it's the black thing that's coming up here again on, on the issue. Obama is part of that piece. All that other stuff. Talk to me. Here's the thing. What about the Muslim if, thing? How do we solve that? If part? our president had had a coherent national security strategy, and if we were in a position of strength, if we weren't leading from behind, you wouldn't have such a refugee crisis in that area. But he has led from behind. Hillary Clinton has been part of that problem. Her biggest credential is that she was Secretary of State. If you look at where the Middle East is right now, as compared to where it was when George Bush left office, right? we had allies in Egypt. Hosni Mubarak was an ally. His actions were predictable. Libya dismantled their nuclear program after we invaded Iraq. This is a fact. right? Gaddafi was not ideal, but he was a predictable actor. Assad in Syria, same thing. Less than ideal, but we knew where he was going. The people who have replaced Mubarak in Egypt, right, and, uh, and, and Assad, the folks that are opposing Assad, and the folks who have taken over Libya are hostile actors insofar as our interests are concerned. And that region is not any more safer than it was. And the first thing we have to do is define a coherent national security strategy and define what our interests are in Syria. And our yeah. president has not done that. Oh, boy, he's ready. He's ready. I, 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 I disagree with you. I, I, I think Obama issue? has a coherent <laughs> national yeah. security policy, and that is to reduce the security of the United States. Because <laughs> it's like the old saying, you know, the first time's coincidence, the mm -hmm. third time's happenstance, the, or the second time's happenstance, the third time's enemy action. You know, you look at this invading state after state and destabilizing the entire oh. Middle East, you know, is that really an accident? Mm -hmm. Could somebody be that dumb, you know, to do this just by accident? I'm not. Well, I'm poking not Israel it. in the eye hasn't been a great <laughs> aspect of policy either. His campaign people were over there opposing the regime in Israel, trying to get them unelected. Mm. It, it went the other way, despite mm. that. Mm. And, and Israel is an ally, a staunch ally, and one that is increasingly isolated okay. out there. Well, I'm gonna ask Richie. Rich, 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 I'm gonna ask you a question. Yeah. Okay. Why couldn't we have gone to the American Muslim mosque and say? take care of this issue well i think that's that's something why, why, we, why not i think I, I don't think there's we any, didn't get him involved why why didn't we? i think that's, that's i think that's one element i the, yeah i think it is up I, I know some what we might call is moderate reasonable fully assimilated muslims and uh, uh they're friends of mine and i work with them and some of them are going to be participating 
in some training because okay. they want to learn how to be Americans and they want to participate in civic life. This is not the the mainstream. I mean, the ISIS style Muslim is not the mainstream Muslim, but it is these moderates who have got to take the point. They they've got to take point. But they've all they're all relative to the to the religion now. They've got it. I understand, but I mean, there used to be. I mean, the Catholic Catholics or the 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 Inquisition. They used to burn witches, right? Uh, but they don't do that anymore, right? The, even the Irish and the Protestants used to blow each other up in Ireland. They don't do that anymore because the forces within the Christian faith was able to moderate. The Muslims need to moderate too. I take a look at the Middle East. Iraq, they haven't had a reformation yet. I, yeah, I take a look at Iraq, Saudi Arabia, these countries. 100 years ago, it was 1916. What was going on in those countries? Most of them were still nomadic tribes people. They still fought, you know, with spears. They barely had guns. And 100 years later, once they discover oil, you know, they're driving around in Mercedes Benzes now. Yeah. Right? But culturally, they haven't had the hundreds of years and the establishment of traditions and institutions that we've had. And they've, the, these passions and prejudices we've seen in their world have always been there, but they've been tamped down by military strongmen who've kept a lid on it. Well, the lid's been removed, and they've all come out. In 100 years from now, maybe we'll say, well, this was the time when we worked it out. This was the turbulent time. It may have been inevitable. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, or in 100 years, we'll be speaking Arabic. I well, mean, or, the, the, or in 100 Islam, years, we'll be speaking is, Arabic. Islam is not like other religions. It's not that just that they haven't had a reformation. It's that they've never had a New Testament. They have a totally mm, different sweet. view of you know, church versus state. Islam is everything. Islam is the state. It's the military. It's the laws. It's an all-encompassing Borg of a religion that is completely different. And so, you know, I don't. I think it may be a mistake to to look to some sort of moderate reform effort. Uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's. Are the American Muslims in that same arena mindset? What do you think? I don't know. I mean, some of them, some of them seem to be. If you watch, um, if you watch some of Farrakhan's speeches, you know, yeah, it's, but that's it's not, like you know, let's kill all the white people and 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 run everything by Sharia. Yeah, I that's mean, that's not typical. I mean, that's. I mean, it doesn't take very many people to cause a lot of damage, and I think that's why people like Trump are taking a broad, brush approach. But the fact is, most of the Muslims that <clears throat> my stepdaughter went to school with, and some of the people that you know, I know one that owns a stock brokerage. Uh, I know another one who. Um, now these are Americans, right? These are American citizens who are Muslim. How do they react? If you, if you they call hate them up, it. And they're embarrassed. I've, why I've didn't they come out publicly and deal with the issue? Some of them have, but they don't have the size of megaphone. Yeah, but my point, I right? say publicly. I'm not talking about just on the side. Saying, hey, to ask them I mean, to hey, come on the show. Come on the show. Listen, you know the, what I mean? One, one yeah. of the women, um, she has been working with the FBI. She's been speaking with prominent Muslims all over the country. Uh, the other one uh, speaks with. You know, he's an investment person. He's not a high-profile public figure, mm -hmm. but he works within his circles. I think that some of them are doing what they can. The ones that need to come out publicly are the uh, moderate imams, and and I don't know all the titles, and I'm have to admit I'm we largely ignorant you know, of, we, we, we of an, how the I Muslim had an imam here the other day. You but know these, what I mean? from but this these, area. But they're the ones that have to start condemning ISIS. Right, right, and right, also. Right. One of the problems we have is the nature of the caliphate is such that as long as they have territory, mm -hmm. um, they command Muslims to to come and fight. Now, and they have been, thousands of them have been. Well, now they're saying, fight where you are. Okay. And we have San Bernardino. Okay. So, if but if you get rid of the territory, okay, right. Of course, that's going to involve force, and that opens up a whole other can, can yeah. of worms. But still, we, we get getting back to the point where when we first started talking about this issue, we talked about, i.e., the, the whole issue of the immigrants uh, from, from Mexico aspect of it. Yeah. Again, I have problems getting Mexican-Americans to come on the show to talk about this issue. And I'm glad that Scott brought some of the some of the points that were up there. Mm -hmm. My point is that my point is that, and then the same thing with the Muslim aspect of it. You know, the mosque aspect, that, that, that last shooting, that person was going to that yeah. particular mosque. I can get okay? you some people so, on so, the show. So my point want. is that we're talking about it, and, yeah. and hopefully, uh, hopefully, Amer Americans are listening out there to say they've got mm -hmm. to step up to the plate. And in all due, and in all due, and all due respect, when you start thinking about this thing, that's why we have an application process. That's why we have an application. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to come here. 
But the bottom line, we have to have that application yeah. process because yeah. yeah. otherwise, we're going to have continuous the, the woman in San Bernardino. That's exactly had gone what happened. It. The, the same, system completely no, failed. They, they just didn't. Hey. No, no, it didn't <laughs> fail. It was programmed <laughs> to right. fail because right. yeah. it would regard the fact that she posts on social media saying, I hate the United States yep. and let's yep. destroy it. They yeah. would regard that fact like, as oh, yeah, let her write on it. Yeah, right, exactly. Okay, that's that's the problem. Yep. The problem yeah. is that the process yeah. itself has become insane. And, and that's, know, that's what's really upsetting because good, folks, we've but we been, may have to cut it off at this point. We've had a national this. security <laughs> state for your... most of this entire new century, right? And okay. all this domestic surveillance, okay. all of us being under surveillance for almost 15 years now, still can't prevent that. All right, boys, looking good. You can see we're gonna have some good going. We're gonna take a short break folks we'll be right back and we'll start with scott <laughs> there we go you are watching oregon voters digest this program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times tell a friend Could have been on about another four or five hours, maybe four or five months, if you will, <laughs> talking about this. Asking, With some now, coffee, but sure. now we've got to start getting into, into solutions, of this, and we were just getting into it right before we took a break. And so let's just go on, continue the discussion, and go along with that particular line. Okay, we talked about the Muslim aspect of it, right? That's what we were, right? Well, we were talking about solution, and mm -hmm. and like I said, we we do have a process, an application process. Everybody wants to get here. We've got all sorts of cultures here. Right, you got me, and uh, and that's what makes us so great because we're all speaking English. That's the other issue that I was in. I think it should be a. It, it should it not be the language of, the, of this country? Throw it I, out. I I would be in favor of that, and the reason why. why? It's not a. It's not a libertarian <laughs> stance. I I confess that. I don't agree. What's with a libertarian? You keep bringing that word up. I've never heard of libertarians. Is yeah. there? Are there such an? That's an animal. That, that's that's just like the donkey and the... Nine out of ten thing. libertarians would disagree on the definition of, of libertarian. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably true. But uh, I, you, told I, me, you told me it was a conservative and a, liber a, 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 a liberal. Fiscally conservative, liberal. socially tolerant. And, and a liberal, yeah. right? And, and Why don't you just go on and stay in the party and just go on and make changes? Oh, I What's have so much fun from outside the party. Oh, but, is that really? uh, <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, but, I've but, asked myself uh, the same question. <laughs> well, let's see, talk, talk about that real quick. But, but, What's just, but, um, the English, we're talking about English. English as a first language. You know, in, in, in college and in, in life, I've seen that binational states are more often unstable internally, politically. And you take a look at Canada with Quebec wanting to peel off and, and Nigeria with the different tribes and the different languages and they're fighting. Binational states almost never work. You know, Belgium, it kind of works. Why, it, why, why, of, why not? Because there are there are uh, different cultures involved, and language is at heart of, of a lot of cultures. If you, the American melting pot works because of assimilation, okay. and I think I'm I'm a proud really, Irish you, American. You really think we've assimilated? We haven't. No, I'm not. We're still talking about race. I'm saying I'm <laughs> saying that it's 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 a process. But my 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 ancestors, German Americans, Irish Americans, Slovak Americans. You know, we assimilated, and the first thing that all that they all had to do was learn English to assimilate and to be able to operate. Now that we still have our traditions and our heritage, and we take pride in it, but we're Americans. We're not Irish people living in America. We're Americans of Irish descent. Well, you say that with such strength, That's God. Give, give me, give me, give me your version. English as a first language, or English as a second language. Which which, you, which way do you go? I wanted to touch upon an, an issue that's come up in the legislature about this because you me. have ESL programs, English as a second language, and what we discovered during this last legislative session was that the way the system is set up, because if you're a school district, you get additional funding mm -hmm. for the students that are ESL. So that means the districts essentially have a profit motive. Yeah. They have a reason to keep kids in those programs even beyond the point where they don't need to be anymore. It doesn't work. I've and seen it it, it is actually affecting their academic performance yeah. over the long what, term. What did we do before that? I'll, I'll tell you what we did. What, 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 what I'll did tell we you what we did. What's Immersion. Back, back, back during yeah. you know, the Statue of Liberty days, all yes. right? 
when there were a bunch of Irish people over here or a bunch of Jews or a bunch of whatever it was, they were the people you walked over and you went to the, you know, the German American Assistance Association mm -hmm. or you went to the, 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 the Jewish Assistance Association. And each of these immigrant groups that came in took on a responsibility for educating and supporting the new arrivals. OK, mm -hmm. and and then, you know, then you learn the language, so forth and so on. This whole attack on the melting pot is an attack on America and a deliberate attempt to weaken us. Mm -hmm. and, and people who speak against the melting pot are speaking against continuing America as a sort of a light in the world and, and, and sort of an exceptional place where people can get along by fueling division and conflict. Mm -hmm. And it is also something you know, that there's, there's a moral component to this that, you know, when you've got some poor guy making minimum wage, why on earth is it fair to take seven, eight, ten percent of what he makes? You know, if, even if he's making nothing, they're taking fifteen mm -hmm. percent of it on one side or another, and say, "Let's go hire a bunch of translators so we can translate all of our governments and our government documents into ninety different languages Jeez. and fuel this <laughs> whole rise." Including Klingonese, by the way. Jeez. And 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 so mm. and, yeah. and and the system gets more and more complicated and more because it's accommodating, it's it's fueling, it's fostering, it's saying, "Yes, let's have all these differences." They're wonderful. Let's celebrate them. And they get more and more expensive. And the whole thing is collapsing under the weight of people who are inflaming differences mm -hmm. for their own, you know, self-aggrandizement. It's a terrible it feeds thing. Identity he actually politics. reminded me of something that, I, that happened a couple of weeks ago. I'd gotten a ticket um, in, in early November, my first in years, right? And so I go to pay it. And there's this big, huge line of people. And one of the people that works there at the courthouse comes out. And he asked if anyone we can service people who speak and then it was this really obscure language and I'm thinking Esperanto does anybody speak that it was like Portuguese right mm -hmm. so if anybody here speaks Portuguese I could help you immediately and there's a lot of people I was like but really mm -hmm. who speaks mm -hmm. Portuguese around here nobody but it was an option so I guess if, if one person in that line had been Portuguese or spoke Portuguese they <laughs> they would have been very well served now and he was speaking any other language like what, Cambodian? No. Like anything else? No. But okay, but, but again, Portuguese we got covered. But again, I think that I think I think James brings up a real good point. Yeah, within the the idea of assimilation, you know, it, there's always these that what things were happening, and I and I, when I think about, in all due respect, mm -hmm. and people have to look at me from the standpoint, well, I'm black. Yes, I'm an American. I'm a black American, but during my particular days, I my the identifiable group with me were Africans. But these were slaves, if you will. Yeah. They, they were assimilated because who didn't what, come over voluntarily? No, 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 no. But they were assimilated because they were doing the work, mm -hmm. and the folks who were supervising to a certain degree were basically saying, "Hey, you got." They were being taught, if you will, and so they picked it up. And then from that point on, they picked it up in church. They were taught, mm -hmm. if you will, through communities and this, that, and the other. So I think it's very important. I think that's a major piece. I like I like what he the point he was making. We got we got some ninety languages here, yeah. and here we are today. Again, that's why Trump, again, I'm going back to Trump. He makes the point about immigration. Right off the front, you think about Mexicans. I've got to speak Spanish. And a lot of people are very irritated. Getting on the bus, and all of a sudden, you got to you got to step this way. No, it's not step this way. I don't know, I don't know, the, I don't know the Spanish for it. But the, fact, but the out. fact of the matter. But the, fact, but the point Alex of the Richa. matter is a lot of people are angry. A lot of folks are in there. They won't yeah. say anything. In all due respect, and that's why I think it's so important. For Mexicans to communicate, Mexican Americans, they feel yeah. the same way. But guess what? They don't say it. Well, and what I've seen with a lot of these policies is a lack of reciprocity. Because similarly, um, you know, when it comes to things like tuition equity and that, nobody else does that. You couldn't, if you were an Oregonian and say, "Hey, I want to go study at a university in Mexico," I, I doubt that they're going to bend over backwards and say, "Okay, you get in-state tuition, right?" But, well, but not we even... might have a way to do it for them yeah and a lot of these policies are very one-sided like but that even not, immigration mexico enforces immigration but they go ahead try to sneak into mexico and see what happens but they don't but they don't require folks let's say for the English, do they have spanish as a second language yeah? in mexico <laughs> i somehow seriously doubt it uh, oh really it, why it, right and i imagine though that speaking english you'd and be able to get a lot by of because folks, they're germans and everything else they are simulated mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of folks from from this country russians uh Italian, all kinds of folks but guess what you speak Spanish. <laughs> if you don't, guess what? You're going to be losing out. Otherwise, you got to move to a community <laughs> where you got a bunch of other folks that speak the same language. Fair? Yeah. And once again, I mean, that's one of those issues where, I mean, he brings it up too in so many words, the fundamental transformation of America, where you, some <coughs> folks start off with this premise that what we had here 
was something that you had to change. Now think about that. You've been married for a long time, right? Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been married for yeah, eight yeah. years. Oh, yeah, similarly, so. right? Yeah, very much so, I yeah. love my wife dearly, but I don't think of it in terms of I love you, I wish to fundamentally transform you. So I think that she if, if you well, <laughs> right, exactly. If, but similarly, way, if, anything, you if, if you're starting yeah. from the premise that there's something terribly wrong with this country and so wrong that you must fundamentally transform it, then I, I think that's a lot of what we've seen play out. Over so the are you saying years. to me that the legislature is looking at it now from the standpoint that they might have made a mistake? No, they're they're hell bent on continuing what? their fundamental Why? transformation because because their vision is not an American vision. Their vision is a socialist totalitarian it's a vision. vision. It's a yeah. European vision. It's I don't even I don't even think like it's Finland, fair to call it like European. Finland or Norway maybe. I don't even think it's fair to call it European. It's mm -hmm. a, it, it's a vision that that it, that it's important to bring America down in the world. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But you know, again, to uh, just throwing this on the table, like I said, we started talking about it. it's about eating, right? If you're mm -hmm. getting a check, if you're getting a check, it's not an issue. That's right. It's if very you're not getting a check, guess what? I, it's an issue of mine, okay? <laughs> and I, Trump brought it up because in all due respect, the middle class, if some of that middle class was, was, was if we were back another way and they were all working, this would not be an issue. We'd probably be looking at about 20 million a day. <laughs> well, yeah, and look, on paper, people can say the economy's better, the economy's gotten better. I, I think, if anything, it's oh, no. been kind of stagnant. It's not been. All you have to do is look at labor force participation because unemployment rates, I don't think, are a true reflection of what's going out there because beyond a certain point, you no longer qualify for them. Beyond a certain point, people leave the workforce and give up looking for another job. Discourage Under those workers. circumstances, you, you no longer count as unemployed according to those numbers. The fact is, labor force participation is at the lowest levels that it's been in my lifetime. Well, believe me, there's a lot of people, and I've talked to a lot of folks since, 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 who were part of the middle class. Uh, they were drawing unemployment. So they were kind of like still eating, okay? Now they're losing unemployment. And they're joining that crowd. Yeah. Trust me. And, I, and, I, and, I, and, and Trump is there. He's at, he's at the front of the line. It's not him, the person. It's what he brings to the table. Mm -hmm. Anybody could have recited where he's at. He just, uh, he just got enough money, if you will, and power to be able to make the statement. And, and you also have inflationary pressures. Okay. And you're okay. starting to feel that, especially when it comes to commodities and things like food. Because, you know, something's going to happen eventually when you keep printing trillions upon trillions of dollars okay and i think people are Trump's starting to feel that in their pocketbooks the fact that the dollar in your pocket is worth less than it was eight yeah. years ago mm -hmm. trump's not a conservative he's not a liberal he's not a libertarian but i think if he got elected or even if he was nominated i think he would blow up and set political correctness back a long ways because what? i think he'd pull the blinders off and expose it for what it is i think it i think it would be i think he would expose it as an instrument of force to make us live the way we don't want to live. But you know, you could get the average little guy that's part of his crime. He would, he would say the same thing, but he doesn't have the money. He or she doesn't have the money. That's right. Fair? Oh, I mean, there's a lot of folks that are out there. Okay. Yeah, but he's okay. got the money. Okay. Now, we got about we got about another 15 minutes, and we want to talk, again, talking about solutions. You brought up an idea, and that's why you were on the show last week. You brought up an idea from the standpoint where we can have some discussions that at the end of the day, we can, we can kind of bring some of those folks out front, if you will, and sure. get them a part of the process. Because right now, uh, the, uh, the status quo are basically running the whole piece for their interests. They're, they're basically anti-Trump because guess what? Uh, when you start thinking about this whole piece, if you'd ask the, uh, the, 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 not necessarily the established folks in the past, they're saying, what, what, how do you rate Congress? <laughs> no one thinks about the Congress piece. We never talk about that solution, like term limits and things of that nature. We, we never talk about that. Why aren't they talking about that? Well, there's so, the thing. If you're a member of Congress, you are term limited because you have to run every two years. No, but and, they're still making that million bucks plus. Well, <laughs> and the thing about it is, though, you're right. You'll see these surveys where they say, oh, Congress has a 3% approval rating. And I said, well, that's fine. 98% of these guys are going to get reelected in landslides. And yeah, yeah that's because they have the money. That's because they have the gerrymandered districts. Sign, but it's this attitude solution, because... If they, they, if they would sign a contract, you know, I'm running for office. And I say, this is my platform. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm running. And then all of a sudden they get elected, okay? They get down there and all of a sudden they bring the meat home. <laughs> fine. But if they don't bring the meat home, they should be out of there. Well, yeah, that's I part got, of it. I, got a, I got, got a better idea. We're just talking. Because he's run for Congress, and I helped run a congressional oh, campaign run, back run, in 2004. I've run for office. He's run for office. Good on. You got a better <laughs> idea. I, I, I Talk got a better to idea. Okay. I mean, people, there's only one way to solve the economic problems that we have, okay? And that is to shrink the government. Shrink the government. Shrink now, the government of the people, by the people, for the people? It's, there, there ever, you know, you can't 
open any business without drowning in red tape. And if you look oh, at the number of people yeah. starting businesses, it's like dying. There's okay? more businesses closing so, than opening. So my right idea now. is simple. Okay, we say to Congress, every two years, the total number of pages in the statute book or the total number of words has to fall by 10 percent for the next 20 years. Just every t and if. And if the total number of words in the statute book and the total number of words in the regulations isn't down by 10%, mm -hmm. none of you guys get reelected oh, at all. Wow. So, yeah. you know, amend the Constitution that way. Mm -hmm. And then somebody can start pruning, you know, like every little thing. <laughs> the instinct to regulate has overcome us. You know, somebody came to my office the other day asking about this marijuana stuff, you know. Yeah, right. I pulled this thing up. 66 pages of single space rules about how to run a marijuana store, you know? And it's, it's like, where to put the cameras, you know? You can't think of anything for yourself about any business at all anywhere now. You know, you've got a rule book. That, and, and then the, the net result of that is that the rules are too complicated for anybody to follow. So now, instead of courts having people follow rules, we have this total system of anarchy where there's no longer any rule of law And everyone's anymore. a criminal. And yeah. everyone's a criminal. Yeah. Everyone's a criminal. Mm -hmm. The laws are all so complicated that no one can follow them. And there's no constituency for simplification mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's one of the worst problems that we have, apart from the financial problems, which are maybe the... You know, that's that's yeah, what enables hand in hand. That's what I mean, enables it. You know, once you rip the Constitution into tiny shreds and say, let's throw away all constraints on government, the business, you know, the Constitution said we couldn't have a printing press. But once you give the government a printing press so they can print as much money as they want, then that's the end, you know, and, and it all maybe it all follows from that. I don't know. It's, well, it's, the government, they can print money, but they can't create wealth. You know, if you take a look at, at uh, something that the government funded completely, like the lunar module for the Apollo program, right? Yeah. Government paid the money, but Grumman invented the lunar module and all of the special materials that resulted in the spin-off technologies and all these other things. It's Velcro always, and tang. My, my point is the private Kevlar. sector yeah. creates wealth, pharmaceutical companies, manufacturing companies, whatever it is. Government can only move wealth around. It can only move money from here to there. You know, if you take a look at a government job uh, maybe somebody working on a road, digging, digging a trench or something, people will point to that person and say, government created that job, but the money needed to pay for that job didn't come from one person. It came from that person and that person and, and that person and you and you and me. And that's harder to put a face to, which makes it hard to make a rhetorical well, argument you know, for. You make a good point because I'm thinking about I went, the thing, first thing that comes out to my mind. At one point in time, it was a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And James and Lane, I said, hey. We, lo we lost that a long we time lost, ago. We, we, we used to <laughs> limit government, now wow. government limits us. Wow. Wow. But that's listen, much but listen right Bruce. Now. Let's talk about your piece because I think okay. that's a part of that right, solution. Right. Because in all due respect, you're going to get some people elected, maybe talking about things that we were talking about in terms okay. of solutions, like term limits. And, and cutting down paperwork and create more yeah. business and okay. Look, look at the problems that we have in the big picture Go with on. government now. You've got charismatic leaders who are able to use their charisma yep. to influence people who are uninformed and disengaged. Great debaters. You've got you've got money, people who are spending gobs of money, Soros on the left, the Cokes yep. on the yep. right. Yep. Yep. And this money impacts people who are disengaged and ill-informed. Right. If you have a voter who is informed and disengaged, I'm not saying that these forces won't have any impact, but they'll have less because they'll have enough to work with themselves to make up their own minds and be more of a critical thinker. Mm -hmm. Okay, So I believe that if we want to preserve our freedom and if we want to rebuild our prosperity, we can't do it from the top. We have to pay attention to the top. It's important. But we have to do it at the bottom. We have to reestablish a culture of civic involvement and civic education at the local level where we live. And a way to do that is with school boards, cemetery control boards, water boards, fire and rescue. Teach people how to get involved and take responsibility for their own governance. Some of the people you know, who get elected, learn how to function in these positions from a limited government perspective. You know, some of them might stay where they are. I'm a water commissioner. Some of them might catch the bug and rise. Some of them might do a few years and drop out, okay. but they'll be civically involved. Okay. 
if we work at that from that angle, we will have eventually enduring freedom. And from these people will rise state legislators and county commissioners. And it's already happened. And city count, And it's already happened. In 2013 and 2015, Western Liberty Network provided training to over, I think it was like 280 people. And over 200 of them got elected to some office, some incredibly low, like Mosquito Control Board, some much higher, like ESDs for counties and, and school boards. And... And we have a sitting state representative. Sitting state a representative program. got his start from these conferences. So, so how do you bring the masses to the table? Well, what we how are you going to bring the masses? I'm talking about the diverse. I mean, yeah, uh, you know, we, we hold one way we do it is by holding events, and one of the events that we have coming up is on January 30th, okay. Western Liberty Network's fifth what's annual the, the make up of activist that conference. It's going to be just people who care about their communities okay. that we're able to reach, who want to know how to engage and to be effective. You know, there are a lot of people that want to, but they don't know how. Mm -hmm. And some people just give up because mm -hmm. it seems like an intimidating process to them. So we're going to teach some basic skills, like how do you testify in front of a committee? You know, if you're going to be involved in a campaign, how do you write a campaign plan? How do you lobby a legislator? How do you blog effectively and write letters to the editor? Uh, how do you manage a campaign? How do you work with volunteers? Mm -hmm. How do you interview with the media? A lot of these kinds of things. We have professional public speaking coaches, you know, who will, people can sign up for slots and get tips on how to improve their technique. Oh, parliamentarians. Ro yeah, Robert's Rules of Order. How do you run meetings? We've got study materials and you can take a test to enter the National Association of Parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. There are going to be three candidate debates for U.S. Senate, Governor. These are samplings of the people that we're, we're talking about right now. <laughs> yeah, and I've done outreach to, to some people in the Muslim community. I'm we're going to try to do some outreach to people in the minority community. Anybody can come. Western Liberty Network approaches these things from a limited government perspective, but everybody is welcome. It doesn't matter what your ideology is. We need a more enriched civic life at the grassroots. You know, Benjamin Franklin famously said that we had a republic if we could keep it. That is a challenge to us. That is a challenge to us to govern ourselves. And if we're going to govern ourselves, we have to have the skills necessary to do it. Mm -hmm. We can't mm -hmm. be intimidated out of it. Mm -hmm. Once you pick up a few skills, it's not so intimidating okay. anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, how does the budget process work? It's, oh my God, it's incredibly <laughs> complex. And it can be complex. But if you give them a few basic tools on how to track it, mm -hmm. pretty soon, you know, they stumble around, but then they learn their way. Okay. Well, you know, I, I like the I like the approach, but again, the, the sampling, you know, you, like I said, you, you, you're going to be bringing mm -hmm. some candidates, people are going to be running for a specific office aspect of it, like well, the governor. We, yeah, we have we do have debates for higher level offices so like, people can learn about the issues. Governor. you got a national? You know, uh, the U.S. US Senate? Sen in the morning, we're going to have a U.S. Senate candidate debate okay. at lunchtime, and, you know, a, a package includes a hot lunch. We are having a, a Secretary of State candidate okay. debate. Okay, that's a state. And in the afternoon, Oregon governor debate. Okay. And we're inviting people from different parties. So far, all of the major Republican candidates have confirmed. Okay, now what about the other part? Now, you got well, another we've we invited we've invited Democrats, and there are uh, some other people in, in other parties, like the Independent Party and the Libertarian Party. you got the party governor, you got the, you got the governor, you got the Democratic governor who's going to be there? She's being invited. I don't expect her to show. No, wait, wait, don't say that. But, no, no, but no, no, if no, she no. does, she, she, you she's going to be welcomed. Okay, okay. And she's going to be treated fairly. Can I suggest something? You Sure. I tell you, we got the largest district in the state sitting right here in Multnomah County. Yeah. Okay, I mean, we got the chairman of the Republican Party, we got the chairman right. of the Democratic Party. That's right. Have you invited those people? The chair, well, this is a candidate debate. What? This is a candidate. No, debate. they were candidates. I'm just, my point is that oh, everybody's invited. I'm, 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 I guess you, my you, point, mean, you mean invited to attend the conference? Well, we're talking about solutions now, right? Yeah, you're talking they, about. They also have a platform too. Yes. In well, terms of what the issues are in their respective areas. We have. We it's have, just a good sampling. I'm just listen, throwing it out. All of these people, everyone, is invited to come and attend this conference and participate. Right. And there are options that are available through which they can disseminate their information. Okay, okay. We'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll work on that other piece. Yes. And I'm going to give a citizen state of the state address. Okay, go on. Yeah. Oh, you are, are you yeah. going to be there? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Okay. He's a future speaker. And what's your message? My message is going to be essentially laying out the vision for Oregon and a lot of the problems that I've seen around here. The um, thing is, is that I was from southern Oregon. My boss represents a very rural district, and 
the division between urban and rural in this state is tremendous and it's only growing more and more. I see it as I make my way around the state. And Mr. Buchel works on a lot of these issues too in his day job as an attorney. I mean, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Before the show, I asked mm -hmm. him, he works with some of the miners. I mean, those guys are getting run over well, year Well, it, it makes year. sense because you were there at the legislature. I yes. guess my point yes. is that we got the largest district in right. the state of Oregon. What? And when most of the issues come out of this area, yeah. both on the D side, whether it be gun control, whether it be, uh, whether, whether it be marijuana, the whole nine yards. Well, meanwhile, well, we've got federal land burning all over the state. But <laughs> Western, Western Liberty Network, the host of this event, is a 501c3 okay. nonpartisan tax okay. exempt. Okay. So we cannot coordinate with any political parties or candidates. I mean, we coordinate. We, what do you mean? You just got through telling me you're going to have the gubernatorial candidates there from multiple parties. Uh, yeah, but something okay. not showing up. I want to know what's going on. It's it's. <laughs> <laughs> listen, Bruce, I'll tell you the, the huh? 501 huh? They prefer to be comfortable in yes. their invincible oh, that ignorance. Oh of no, the issues. We, well, we're going to have to contact the, the, them. Listen, I'm, I'm saying, Kate, you better get down there. The 501c3 rules are arduous. They are, and, they are and, and okay. they're uh, not always intuitive. We'll just leave it from issue standpoint. Yes. Bruce, yes. please don't make me lose my nonprofit status. Oh, I. But well, you know, Western Liberty Network, we don't endorse or oppose a candidate, legislation, and that's fair. Or, See, my point is that you're educate. teaching the people, you're educating we, we educate the people, people how to engage, and you're giving them samples of yep. folks, and these hopefully the idea is that yep. these people will respond to what you're talking to. Can I give the website? Oh, you can get the website. Throw, okay. it, throw it out there. WesternLibertyNetwork.org has all of the information there, downloadable materials, and you can register. Okay. And you can secure sponsorships. Okay, I'm gonna get for the first time. I'm gonna critique what you've done. Already. Go for it. You've already done it, right? Yeah. Critique him. Critique him. Well, I, I, I'm not going to What do you think about it? No, just, just basically share with him about what he just shared with you. What do you think? Is this something you, you it aligns with the solution of the, some of the issues that we have? It helps to train people to participate in these processes. Okay. But where we are as a country is somewhere where there's sort of a fundamental problem with the population and they're distracted and maybe they don't have time to pay attention and they're unable to penetrate the propaganda and we have an entire county Multnomah County where people are just full of, of just the grossest mis misinformation and and the real challenge that, that we face is how does one deal with this sort of invincible ignorance you know that thinks it's better to burn down a forest than manage it or that thinks that we can have an economy if we just zone out sector after sector after sector. No, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that, you know. Or make it against the law to build a house on most of the land in the state right, and then right. wonder why housing is becoming right. unaffordable for that's, working people. That's a good statement. Yeah. We're, we're there, folks. We're getting the credits right now. <laughs> oh. Thanks again, folks. Look like it's be wild. We'll be here another time around. WesternLibertyNetwork.org. Register okay, guys, today. Scott, good job, good job, good job. Thank you. Thanks, folks. I'll see you next week, right? Right on. Okay, we're off there, but we can keep talking. We keep so talking. that was that was an entire hour. Did we just yeah, I'm trying to say, man, we, we had so <laughs> much to say. Goodbye. We could have been here two weeks. Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest. The program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now.